and welcome to the Talent War Group Leadership Collective. Um, I'm Lisa Jasser and I'm here with Joe Bernard and I am going to, when he started giving me his resume, um, I know he's a cool guy, but I didn't know how cool, so I'm gonna throw this over to him for initial introductions. Go ahead, Joe. Hey, Lisa, it's great to be with you. Congratulations on being the permanent host of the Talent War Group. I think this is awesome and uh, you're up to the task. Uh, hello, everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you today on this topic. My name is Joe Barnard. I was in the Air Force for 33 years as a pararescue and combat rescue officer. Retired as a lieutenant colonel in 2016. Got out, traveled the world a little bit. Then I ran a wireless construction company as a COO for a while. And uh, then I am now the executive director of the Ford School. We're a residential treatment center for teen boys. And uh, it's great to be part of this group. And because I normally leave the best for last, I will give just a spurt about Noah and then I will um, let him sit there and be parsley. So referring to somebody as parsley is kind of a compliment. Um, the, the idea behind it is if you've ever gone to a fancy restaurant, there's always parsley on the plate. Nobody knows what it's there for, but it makes the plate look better. So if nothing else, uh, Noah's here to make us look a little bit better, but, uh, to be real, he's also here specifically to make sure that we're getting to a point. And at the end of this, anywhere between 30 and 30 minute an hour discussion, he's gonna wrap it up and, and tell us if Joe and I actually got to the point. Um, today, we're talking about combating employee disengagement. Um, and I wanna say this could be a discussion between Joe and I, um, with the spatterings of Noah as he sees fit, or this could be a discussion that includes, <laughs> this is a discussion that could include the audience, whoever is listening in on LinkedIn Live, Facebook Live, or whatever media you might be listening to us if you're live. So please leave comments. If you watch this later, not during the live session, you can leave comments and we will actually go back and review them. A lot of times our blogs, our vlogs, um, and even some of our next LinkedIn Live discussions come from the comments that people who listen to us make in the comment section. So um, again, just keeping myself focused, I'm gonna look down on the paper where the only thing it says is combat employee disengagement. I wanna put this in two major buckets. And the one is going to be COVID world, and the second one's gonna be non-COVID world. So the reason why I wanna talk non-COVID is as we've come to realize, whether you're talking about workout plans, nutrition, work-life balance, anything, humans make incremental changes. We're not really good at making huge drastic changes. So everybody is slowly trying to push back to some sort of norm. So we're not completely away from working 40 hours a week in an office. Some organizations are, some of the, the newer, younger generations are good at doing that, but let's be honest, I'm an engineer, I'm an engineer manager. If I don't have people around me, how am I managing? If I don't have clients that I can reach out and touch and ask them what they need from me, how can I engineer? So there's still the non-COVID world out there. When I'm talking about the COVID world with regards to disengagement, I'm talking about virtual work. Um, part of it is you only see whatever's in this frame, which means if I've got Netflix on in the background, you've got no idea. So, um, virtual work, COVID, non-COVID, and then let's peel the onion. So employee disengagement can mean a bunch of different things. And to really keep this to one solid focus discussion, we kind of need to go through simple analytics. And as an engineer, I'm looking at the who, what, where, when, why, and how. Who, who are our employees that, were, that are getting disengaged? But even more importantly, who are the employees that we really care about their engagement level? So when I say that, what I'm talking about is it's not not important if somebody's only 70% efficient or 60% efficient. But some people, it's really easy to tell. They do a work product, they're an individual contributor. Um, when I was an individual contributor for a long time with Shell and I worked virtually, 
you know, it didn't matter when I worked, I could get 18 products completed in a week, but it might be 16 of those were Monday through Wednesday. And then I wrapped up on Friday and had three days off somewhere in there. Those aren't the employees we're worried about. We're worried about the employee like me when I worked virtual for Shell and I was a deep water project manager. Now I had to be engaged and available daily, but also by the hour because I had projects in the Ukraine. I had projects in China. So I not only had to be available, but I had to be smart on topics and have the information readily available. Again, that's COVID world. That was working virtually. Even when I was in the office, I couldn't be in China for the morning stand-up meeting and then be in Ukraine for the morning stand-up meeting and then be in Argentina. I had to dial into each of those and, and it was virtual work. So the who, who are we worried about? We're worried about those people where there's no KPIs. There's no, okay, they did X, Y, and Z this week. Therefore, they're continuing to be productive. So those are the people we're talking about. The what, what kind of engage, disengagement are we talking about? Do they have music on in the background so they work a little slower? Or are they not dialing in? Or are they not answering questions? Or is something that I've seen a lot since we've gone virtual, hey, let me get back to you and, and then calm silent after that. No follow-up, no continuing the discussion, no peeling the onion a little bit deeper on issues and just hoping that they disappear over time. And then the when. So it also matters when people are disengaging. Um, one comment I want to make is when are we allowing employees to disengage so that we can expect them to be fully engaged? I mentioned my um, global project management position. Well, I was never disengaged, which ended up creating a problem with work-life balance. It ended up creating a problem with availability. It also ended up creating burnout. So if this might lead into the why, which of course is the next big question, but if we're not allowing employees to disengage because they're at home and we expect them to be working 24 seven, or they're in a leadership role and they take vacations and we expect them to take our, their computer with them, are we burning them out? And if we are burning them out, then that might be one of the causes for disengagement. And then of course, that why also leads into the how. Is it, how am I going to fix it? But also how am I as the manager maybe pushing that employee away? Um, so before I get into the big discussion session with Joe, I guess the, the, the comment I want to pose or the question I want to pose is what role do we as managers have with monitoring and maintaining that employee engagement? And, and I'm going to start that discussion out by saying whether or not you start a career or you bring your talent in with a written contract. There is an unwritten agreement of what their job is. And as a manager, I often wonder if the employees are getting disengaged because either A, the job I outlined for them is, is boring and mundane, or I'm not keeping up with my end of the bargain, so they're starting to pull away. And so I guess the, the why employees are getting disengaged is, is kind of the first question I want to throw over to you, Joe. Like, what have you seen? What are the kind of drivers for the why? Well, I mean, for individuals, it's, it's different, you know, based on sort of what people are doing. Are they doing logistics? Are they doing spreadsheets? Are they doing operations outside, you know, welding stuff? And it's just repetitive. And, and so, I mean, there's, a, there's all sorts of different whys out there for our, who's listening in. Um, so that, that's where I'm at with that. What I think it's 50, 50. And what I always try to do is, okay, if it's 50, 50, me, I'm supposed to pied piper and pull people along. And then when I was, you know, I spent both times on the enlisted and the officer's side. So it was 50% me to have a good attitude and be competent, you know, 1% better each day when I showed up. So, um, what I try to do is, okay, if it's 50, 50, then I want to do 51. What? What I want to go the extra mile. What can I do to help this person groom them along? I, I much rather work with a known factor of somebody who's here than get rid of somebody and bring in an unknown factor. 
So I think you've got to give a ton of time to people on helping them with their affect, helping them with their health, helping them with their competency, helping with them with their performance. And so that's what I did there. As you started off, man, you had some just some amazing nuggets as you started off. Um, and I love that you did the COVID, no COVID, sort of what we're doing here. We had a general in, when I was in the Pacific, and the Pacific has this tyranny of distance, you know, when I was a Malaysian desk officer. And one of the things he said that always stuck with me is virtual presence is actual absence. And we have to be connected. You have to be present with folks. What, I couldn't do this residential treatment for troubled teen boys if we weren't present. You can't do it over video like this. Even though this video is just so important and we're gaining nuggets from it, people have got to get out and practice sort of what's going on here. If we stay in this video world, I think we're lost. So while this is important and it's a tool, we got to be connected together. So so based on that, Joe, I am I feel, and I'm, I mentioned it earlier, that we really need to get back in person. Um, I think there's so much lost with just text messages, period. And, and that's not even video conferencing. And there's also the, the uncomfortable aspect of to talk to you in more than a text message or a phone call or something where that can be very easily um, turned into something it's not. Uh, whether it's misinterpretation or brevity because you want to get off the phone or you've got like, I've got the slow cooker going in the kitchen simultaneously, those distractions of being at home. But also if, if I turn this into a video call, which, you know, just like we're doing now, I'm inviting you now into my home and it becomes a different environment. So now I have to put up a facade. Noah was actually commenting on everybody's backgrounds before we went live. And it's, hey, is, is this presenting what I want? Am I bringing something forward? Are my kids out of the room? There's, there's so many distractions. I like to be in person for, number one, I want my employees to be able to show me only what they want to show me. So if I have somebody who's got an absolute uh, snowstorm of a life, just everything's their love life's frozen, their kids are icy towards them, just you know, one hell of a personal life. I want them to be able to come to work and be the person that they want to show me. And, and we can't do that in the virtual world. So that's, that's another area that um, I think is interesting with, with this separation, but that also talks about the disengagement is some people are more engaged if you can trap them or you can, contain them in one location. Trap is a completely wrong term, but if you can contain them in one situation, and sometimes I bring Lisa Jaster, and sometimes I bring mom, and sometimes I bring Lieutenant Colonel Jaster, and you know, even I think every aspect of your life kind of has these little compartments. And, and when everything, talking about the COVID world, when everything is such a, a flow and flux, there's no, there's no division. So it is easier to get not only distracted, but get distracted by the people you're looking at because now you're taking in their whole life. Yeah. I think the disengagement on, I've do, I do a ton of Zoom calls um, with what we do. We have 21 facilities in our corporate structure. And so all the executive directors get on a call monthly and we have clinical teams and things of that nature. I think people get disengaged when they start eating on camera and they don't turn their camera off or their cat <laughs> walks in front of the screen and you're seeing a part of the cat you're really not interested in. <laughs> um, you know, there, there's I, those. So I have private calls with people. I'll get on the phone. I go, hey, man, not for nothing, but this is what you're presenting to sort of what it's it's up to the individual to flick the switch and do the right thing in every aspect. That's sort of what's going on. And so compassion and accountability aren't opposing. Well, we got to have compassion. We got to have lightheartedness. And I try to do jokes like you do and aren't funny sometimes, Lisa. I, I think you're funny, though. Thanks. I, you know, but it's just we, we have to sort of be able to call each other out and go, hey, you know, that's plan, execute, debrief, right? The debrief is, is, is crucial, important to the next planning and execution as it goes along. So you got to be brave and give people feedback so they do stay engaged because then they, it, it, the compassion or the, the accountability side of that actually shows them that you care and you're observing and you want them to do good. And people respond to pressure. Um, 
you know, you got to challenge people because you want them to stay engaged, you know, push them a little bit farther, what they could do, help them, guide them along, you know, mentor and groom um, as far as projects come along and all that. So, yeah, get good stuff on your end. You know, I think that's a great point to to call people out as, again, it's not what you're doing. You're doing it in a professional manner, but but to actually say, hey, I, I noticed that you're distracted or I noticed that you're disengaged or because when we're in a meeting, if you and I were sitting in a room, I would never look down and check my cell phone when I'm talking to you. But in this environment, if it's right here, you have no idea. And yeah. so it's very easy to pop in and out of uh, interaction. So to call people out on that, and some of us don't even realize we do it because it's become so incorporated into our life. Our, our smartphones are with us. I took, I take it to the gym with me. I, I take it on walks with me just in case or to listen to music. And if I've got this going, then, well, if I've got an audio book on, but a text message comes through, I'll, I'll pop back and forth between both of them. And am I, am I really paying attention to either? Um, we have a comment here from Corey Schultz. I'm just going to read it. It's um, one problem we are seeing is helping employees define their work hours as they don't have clear delineation with no office. We are trying to train leaders to develop work plans to keep employees engaged. Corey, that's a, a great comment. Um, and I think I said it to my husband today is I've set up an office space. I need to make a conscious effort to walk into the office and disengage in my personal life and make this home office my work hours. And hey, when I'm in here, if you need something, send me a text message, but it can't be the constant back and forth that is so easy to do when you're working from home. Part of that is your personal life really creeps into your uh, work life, but your work life then also creeps into your personal life, where instead of sitting with my kids working on homework at night, they have their computers open and I have my computer open and I'm working while they're working, rather than really being involved in those two hours a day I get with them. Um, do you have any suggestions or recommendations with regards to making work plans or uh, any sort of scheduling that might help with employee engagement? Yeah, absolutely. Boundaries are absolutely crucial to efficiency. And so you have to have boundaries. Um, listen, if your life is in chaos, your work life is going to be in chaos. If all you're doing is putting out fires, then you have chaos. And so being organized and efficient and calm and deliberate in what your task at hand is absolutely has to be there. If you are raising kids, that is a priority or else it's just, you know, I have a 24 year old and a 22 year old and my life now of them being empty nesters and what we're doing and dedicating, a, a, you know, a lot of effort towards this startup of a new facility. I, I wouldn't be able to do this if I had kids or else I wouldn't be raising my family. Right. And so it's about picking and choosing um, your path and, and what you're focused on. And so absolutely, even if you're a computer programmer, you better get up and do some burpees. You better go out and run a mile, you know, every day or, you know, do some sort of workout to where, you have to be a full person. If you are a healthy person, even though you're at a computer all the time, you're going to have better, more efficient, competent work as you're sitting there on a computer. Um, if all you are is, you know, lift weights and you're just this fitness person, then you may want to take some time and start doing some study and listening to podcasts and stuff like that. So you can be a full person. It's really about the individual evaluating where they're at so they can stay engaged. And, and what we're talking about with engagement is, how do we help? How do we grow? How do we make better? That's what, you know, the, the dichotomy of disengagement is, is being engaged and making something better that you're around, whether you're volunteering, working, family, that type of stuff. So being present is absolutely crucial to what's going on. Yeah. And, and those boundaries is, is the key way to be present, I think. And, and making the boundaries known. Hey, yeah. for me, Hey, Alan, I'm in my office. That means if you need me, send me a text message. <laughs> if yeah. not, don't pop up here because I know we'll talk about 17 things that don't need to be discussed now. And then yeah. at dinner, we'll stare at each other. Um, Aaron, One of the Ritz things we have here is, is that time and evidence build trust. And that yes. our staff here models proper behavior for these young boys who are dysregulated and are not neurotypical and they're 
you know, they're, they're having trouble in life. And so, man, play the long game, play, yeah. play the long game associated with stuff and have some consistency as it flows. And if you model that proper behavior, um, if you don't want your kids to pick up their cell phone, when they start driving, don't pick up the cell phone in the car in front of them when they're five, six, seven, eight years old. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's going to pay out. This is all, you know, uh, this is all pretty simple stuff, but the blocking and tackling is so important. Yeah. And, and that modeling holds true. Um, we've had a previous podcast discussion where we talked about some of the similar things that a manager does versus a parent, like some of those same and, and modeling as a manager is, is just as critical as your cell phone example. If, if I'm not blocking off time, if I'm not telling my employees, Hey, seven to 9 PM is my family time. So unless a project site is burning down, don't call me. And, yep. and that's important because then they can model that behavior. Yeah. One of the things I brought in here was critical information requirements. So yeah. we're used to in the military commanders, critical information requirements. When do you have to call me on the cell phone? When can you wait till the next day? When can it be an email? And so we laid that stuff out here. So everybody sort of knows the left and right limits of when do I need to call? When can I make this decision my own? And of course, of course, you want to push as many decisions as you can down and enable your people so they have equal responsibility with the authority that you're giving them, you know? So, um, yeah, good stuff. Yeah. So I want to hit one of the questions we have. It's from Eric Britz. Um, and he asks, do you find it challenging to measure engagement as it relates to desire or passion for the job or company? Do you see a correlation between increased or decreased passion for the work and only engaging remotely? So I think this is interesting because this is specifically kind of what I mentioned in the, the monologue portion is you have your individual contributors and they have tasks that need to be completed. But how do we measure effectiveness of, of our our management, our, our talent, our creative thinkers, our innovators, the ones that don't have a real left and right limit. And, and I'm guessing that you probably have a lot of experience with this, Joe. Um, yeah, I, I mean, in, in the DOD, our profit is readiness. Did we make, you know, better people, highly trained, buy better equipment for the same budget that they gave us? And then on the capitalistic side, you know, there's two ways to make money. You sell more and then you save on your operating cost. And so are you doing both of those? And so I love key performance indicators and having all sorts of measurements and, and employee and client surveys and, you know, um, all that. What, this is really, I think, about the individual. I, I view this whenever I hear a question like this, I'm like, all right, man, what am I doing to make myself better? Am I studying? What don't I know? Like it, I know the stuff I do know. I need to maintain how good I am at that. And then I need to go out and make myself, you know, decimal point percentage better associated with what I'm studying, what I'm learning, who I'm engaging with, um, that type of stuff. I think, you know, when it comes to this COVID Zoom type era, it's not helping the introverts become extroverted. And some people have even become passive aggressive associated with this, where assertive is really the only way to live through life. And I almost even think that people who are assertive are being viewed as aggressive because it's swinging so far left. Um, I think these software as a service companies have huge problems promoting pure engineers that are used to doing ones and zeros that don't have a personality to them. And then they give them a bunch of people. And this is where Mike and George are just so spot on that a generalist who's studied and motivated and has tenacity and, and all the stuff that's a quality human sort of brings to life. They can lead any type of team regardless of what it's doing. And they can also help those folks that maybe aren't as extroverted as they need to be about because we still have to have sort of passion in what we're doing, even if we're on this video screen and not the three three dimensional in present with each other. So um yeah, it's that's a that's a great question, and it's you know it, it's on the enterprise and it's on the individual to sort of meet in the middle and make it better. And I think the point he was making, or the the question he was asking, with regards to passion and engagement, those those are almost the same. Um, working as an engineer, it is absolutely 
interesting, difficult to describe to, you know, my husband is a financial advisor. He works a lot with families who have special needs dependents. It's hard not to be passionate about that. Um, every day he goes to work and he helps people. Yeah. He gets to watch people physically walk in his office and a weight is lifted. They sit up higher, their face changes. It, they, they feel better when they leave than when they came in. How yeah. can you not be passionate about that? Yeah. But there are engineers that are passionate. And I have in Afghanistan watched concrete dry and watched a C-17 land on it. And it was exciting and we were high-fiving each other. So it's, pat it, it's possible to have passion in every field, but you might have to, if you're, if you're that talented and driven employee, you might have to go out and figure it out. And, and Joe, you've mentioned this a couple times and um, I think it's a very interesting point that you need to reach outside your comfort zone. If you're into fitness, and, and this is what kind of hit me, if you're into fitness, well, maybe you need to read something. And it changes how you look at just that area where you work. So my passion, if my passion is fitness, but I read a little bit more about even soldiering and the direct correlation between how you burn carbohydrates versus fats, I get a little bit smarter and I now have found a twist on my job where I can reignite that fire and, and become a little bit more passionate. And it's because I've diversified my knowledge and I've really tried to be a whole person rather than just a fitness guru or just an academic. Yeah. Um, I want to point out here, we actually have somebody who commented and said that um, Derek, it's, it's a longer comment. I'm not going to read it all, but the fact that his company was doing just Zoom and team calls and it created an environment of, of not really allowing the salespeople to be proactive and go out in the field and he started feeling disconnected. He actually fired his company, which I thought was a, a great way of saying it. Rather than I quit, I, I walked away from, from what was taking away his passion it is, is how I read that. So I thought that was really great, Derek, and thanks for the comment. Yeah. There's a lot, you know, a lot of vets struggle with, especially those that retire on what do you do for your second epic life? Because a tribe is so strong and you have such, such cool jobs, whether you're an engineer or, you know, a direct action shooter or a rescue guy like I was. I mean, it's just really cool. The team room's cool. All the aspect of all the professional de development's cool. All the travel and the locations you get to live are cool. So how do you find the next thing? And, and that wireless construction job that I ran, they were great guys. I'm still friends with them. But it wasn't, I was like, man, it just wasn't like what I'm doing now. The sense of service I get from serving these families and these team boys and helping them transition into manhood. And so one of the things our company has, it's we, we promote joy and not happiness because happiness is fleeting and it's sort of peripheral, but joy is to the core. So, man, I've had bad days here. There's bad days that we're just, it's, these boys are, it's messy work taking not neurotypical teen boys and helping them try to see the light that's in front of them. And I mean, but you don't lose your joy associated with sort of, sort of that type of stuff. So what individuals have to do when they look in the mirror, when they're evaluating and they're, they're debriefing themselves at the end of the day, man, am I chasing joy? Is this really my passion or am I just showing up and punching a clock and collecting the paycheck? Because Nobody's really going to be happy doing that. And, you know, everybody has the freedom and it may take one, three, five years of schooling or something like that to sort of move into the job you want. But man, watch some of these Joe Rogan or Jocko motivational videos. Like you can do it if you sort of pick out a plan and sort of move forward that way. So, you know, Joe, when I, when I read this topic and um, Michelle and I kind of talked about it last week briefly, I completely was thinking about it from the managerial, the leadership point of view. Part of that is because of um, my, my day job. Part of it's because being a reserve battalion commander, it's as a commander, as the boss, how do I change this? And, and most of your comments, Joe, are, are really focused on what I as the individual can do to continue to stoke that fire, to include walking away from a job that that isn't perfect. And, and I really like that. And I think I want to peel, I want to peel that onion um, just a little bit more because 
because it is me first. And, and, and I want to talk in the future some other time about managing up because if you're starting to be disengaged, if you're starting to be disheartened because your job isn't what you thought it was going to be, or COVID has made it into something you just hate, but you're just holding on, praying that it goes back to what you thought it was going to be. Well, what can you do as the employee to, to up manage, to, to get your boss to understand that one, I'm unhappy and two, maybe I can maybe I can splinter off into one direction or the other. I don't know if you have any ideas on that. I'm, I'm just kind of throwing something out there. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm the 21st facility inside this amazing company that has all these different facilities to help teens adjust to life that are having issues. And this is the first one they've done from a startup. And so there are certain things that they didn't think of that I'm dealing with that are sort of major type issues. I mean, I could act like, man, you guys owe me this. How did you not think about this or whatever? And, or I could have in between my ears, have a good attitude, like, okay, this is an opportunity for me to use some of my planning skills and sort of help them and, and lay out a proper top timeline with phases of when we're going to implement and spend money. And, and, uh, you know, is there an ROI, a return on investment associated with those dollars? And do we do we agree with it collectively as a team, both here locally and back at corporate? So all problems are an opportunity to have kindness and care and be calm and deliberate and work as a team. Team is so much better than self. Why the hell would anybody want to do a triathlon when they could go out and play uh, ultimate Frisbee with a bunch of teams? I just don't get it. I just don't get it. It's it's. It's all about, it's all about connection. It's all about being with each other, but then that's the differences with the world. We want people to be happy, right? Like if you just point at yourself you probably said, Hey, I'm a triathlete or right. You know, yeah. I'll be by myself. So I am, ha- as long as people are true to themselves and they're corally happy and they're not like putting blame on others, like, man, you're making me, you know, that's only good as comedians do it. You know, like comedians have a bunch of jokes about driving in traffic and like, ah, this person in front of me made me this way. Right. Yeah. But that's the only time that's funny. The rest of the time in the real world, it's all about you and how you make yourself happy, how you help the team, how you give, how you forgive. Um, so um, good on you for wanting to do triathlons. I've done a couple, but I'd much rather do team sports. So, Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've been doing a lot of individual sports, but I definitely like doing them with others. So maybe that, that counts. Yeah. No, um, no worries. No you know, interestingly enough, and, and I'm going to kind of connect this into what Jonathan Valari said, or he made a statement, but, um, you know, getting employees to actively engage and getting employees to manage their careers and manage their futures, a way to do that from a manager's point of view is Jonathan's recommendation here, which is to have employee engagement surveys and it's especially in the virtual world, you can't walk around desks and say, hey, how are you doing today? Tell me what's going on. Um, do me a favor and you know, give me some suggestions about what we can do to increase teamwork. You, you can't do that. And, and one of the things I did in my previous job when I first took over as the director of civil engineering for an engineering firm is I created my own survey monkey. And it was, instead of asking those standard questions, do you trust your supervisor? I actually said, you have a child, you actually like your child, would you let your boss watch that child overnight? And then rate them on a scale of one to 10, 10 being, hey, they could keep them for as long as they want them, and one, hell no, I would never let them. And that was my trust question. And I made 30 questions like that. And it took an hour to take the survey because you couldn't just go through and go fives are good. And um, I got so much feedback and I had so many people reaching out to me to say, hey, I think you're actually interested in the relationships I have or in my opinions or what I think of the company. I had so many more written comments. And then I took that same survey and did it again six months later and was able to compare it. But of course, I changed a few of the questions to be just a little bit more quirky so that, again, it wasn't just a these engagement surveys can be almost disrespectful. Oh, you're going to give me another survey and do nothing with it. 
or, oh, you picked 10 questions off SurveyMonkey and you emailed them to me. No, like you create the survey and, and your employees get to know a little bit about your personality and you get to learn a little bit about their personality on how they take it. If, if you still get just straight fives down the middle, you know that, per, that individual, it probably is one of your more disengaged employees. Yeah, no, I like that. And um, that, that's good stuff there. And, you know, some of these surveys feel, seem like the enterprise is trying to protect itself, not trying to help you or really care about what you think. But it's also, you know, you, you started this off with five W's. I'd like to add cost to five W's. So if an employee has a problem, they should give you five W's and what the cost is. And yeah. I'm, I, I'd i like, to, most of my career, I've been an oversharer. And I've talked to people and they're like, man, I don't know. I don't, they're going to misinterpret that and they're going to run with it. I much rather have people misinterpret me than not know the information. So I much, you know, my risk mitigation is, okay, if they misinterpreted me, then I'll have a conversation. Dude, I, that's not what I meant at all. Here, let me, sorry, sorry, it was on me. I, I didn't explain it good enough for you. So, you know, I want people to give me back the five W's and costs and I owe them an answer. I tell them in our orientation, everywhere I've been, I orientate people. I'm like, listen, I owe you exactly what's going on here because we're grooming and mentoring people to replace us and move up in the position. So you can only do that with knowledge and, and how you sort of execute that knowledge. So yeah, good. I love that you uh, did that with the survey monkey. That's cool. You know, I'm not sure if it was somebody in the talent war group or another organization, but somebody recommended the book to me, uh, No Rules Rules. It's the culture of Netflix. And one of my first LinkedIn lives with, with the talent war group was actually about uh, readership is required for leadership. And as a leader, so if somebody recommends a book to me, I love Amazon Prime, I can either order the paperback or download the audio book immediately. And I have a backlog and I just get through them. Of course, just like this book, I've got no idea who recommended it to me because I probably ordered it three months ago. But it talks a lot about that really open feedback that I'm thinking everyone you work with gets, Joe, every day. And that if that is a standard, then going back to combating employee disengagement, if somebody starts feeling themselves slip back or slip away or get less involved, it's easy for you because you've established that relationship. It's easy for you to say, Hey, is something going on? You're, you're just not performing at the same level, but it's also easy for that employee to say, Hey Joe, I'm struggling here for whatever reason. So, so I think uh, another good point, like I really loved your, your boundaries comment. And then this comment that I'm, <laughs> I'm writing down is really creating that open discussion. And, you know, we've got to gotten to be such, I don't want to say political correctness because I'm not talking about race, gender, creed, any of that, but we've gotten to be so careful on how we speak because we're afraid to be misquoted that, that we've lost exactly what you're talking about is that openness and that ability to say, Oh yeah, well, what is it costing me? And, yeah. and that's really how you started this. Yeah. Two ways you don't go through life is I got a secret or you kids get off my yard. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like, Hey, it's, you gotta welcome, you gotta welcome the collective diversity is amazing. It's, you know, it's, it's just awesome because it, it, it gives you outside the box COAs courses of actions to problems that you're going to solve. And if you want to beat your competitors or, or even if it's healthy competition inside DOD, I don't think units should compete each other. I think they should all have the same tactics techniques and procedures and move forward. But if it's, if it's a capitalistic private company, man, to beat your competitors out, you've got to have outside the box COAs and, and progress it fast. And the only way you do that is by engaged employees who feel valued, who feel like, man, if they make a mistake, they're not going to get ridiculed. You know, man, I, I think I sent to you in the, in the pre email, you know, covers on your TPS reports, right? Like that's yes. one of the funniest movies ever. <laughs> And it's just so true. There's there's places like that around there. There's managers like that around there. There's disengaged employees like that around there. And the only place that should be is in those comedies. It should not be in the real world. Yeah. But they're making fun of the real world because it's out there. And it's just people need chin up, chest out, eyes dilated, not go quietly into the night for what's right, for what is proper, for you know being calm and deliberate about moving the ball down the field. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, we are getting a lot of really great comments. So I want to hit up one more and, and I think we're going to have to close out. So I'm going to ask um, or I'm going to bring up Nate Gladden's comment and then I'm going to give it to you, Joe, for your final comments and then hand it over to Noah. And I'm, I'm just doing that. So Noah, you got to start thinking <laughs> in case you're not paying attention. Now's the time. So Nate makes a comment. Um, that he's struggling with convincing our most senior leaders to update our personal development of subordinates. So I'm going to read into this a little bit, and this might be me putting my personal spin on it, but with all the changes, whether you're talking COVID, non-COVID, um, COVID transitioning back into non-COVID, but no matter what, companies need to be dynamic. I think Talent War Group has stressed that in every podcast, in every discussion, in every um, bit of material we put out there is innovation and it's a dynamic world. And if you're not changing it with it, you, if you're not changing with the world, your organization is going to die on the vine. Well, to do that and specifically with regards to this topic and keeping employees engaged is you have to look at what those individual personal development requirements are for your people. So transitioning back into the manager's hat for engagement and keeping people engaged. Um, one of the examples I heard recently was with regards to KPIs. Again, as an engineer, key performance indicators are fantastic. You do so many projects, you, um, you're on time and under budget and all of those different indicators. How many widgets did you make or design in X period of time? We're very numbers based. The problem is, if you live off those KPIs, how long are those KPIs valid? If taken from a sales perspective, if I get more clients this month than ever before, but I've lost and have no returning clients, then I might have done really, really well on my KPI. But am I am I tracking the right indicator? And the same thing is in tr is true for any type of employee manager management, whether it's engineers, whether it's sales, whether it's interpersonal reactions. Um, how, many, how many times did your business development guy meet with people? Well, if he's going and playing golf six times a week, but no more clients are coming in, that's not, it, that's not good. So how do we develop our employees? And better yet, the question that I'm reading from Nate is, how do we get our leadership to understand that we want an updated personal development? We want help to create these plans so that um, people are allowed to be innovative and creative with their development plans. Yeah. What Nate is asking is how do you push the wet noodle? And that is a very difficult thing to do. Um, I was brought on to that wireless construction company as sort of fix the operations of the company because it was going to go through a merger and acquisitions. And the guy who started the company started out with one G and what he told me goes, Hey, I, I did one through four G. I built that out for Verizon and T-Mobile. I don't have the energy for five G. So, you know, um, the, the system was always progressing. So that guy was self-aware. He knew he needed to get out. He knew he didn't have the energy. You know, he definitely had the smarts, but you know, he sort of wanted to enjoy the fruits of his labor and for move forward. I would, as an individual, I would run as fast as I can from a company where a guy's still wearing a members only jacket or a brown leisure suit, right? And he's not, he's not updating himself with the times and things of that nature. Just because I'm 56 years old, I should have the same energy as the 22 year olds back there that are dealing with the kids and, and have the same interests and stuff like that. And if I don't, shame on me. And you sort of need to do that. So that, the, com the competition is going to eat that company up. And so just like somebody mentioned earlier, they fired their company. That's something that an individual needs to do. And I wouldn't recommend doing that until you have another place to go. Right. You don't just sort of, you know, as all you young folks out there, what you got to do is, okay, I, yeah, I need to leave this. Okay, great. Don't leave until you know where you're going and what your plan is and that type of stuff or else, or else you're going to play the blame game and it's, you know, that type of stuff. It's, it's not good. So. Great question, but pushing a wet noodle is not easy. I mean, how do you make another individual do something that they don't want to do or what their track record has shown? I don't know. I mean, I don't know that one. I don't, I don't think you can. So it's about finding like-minded people that are, you know, 
are creative and adventurous and and experiential and willing to take risks and willing to share in rewards those are now that's the pied piper you want to be behind so yeah and i i think that's a lot of what you know the book the talent war talks about too is is finding the right attributes because the the talent comes in like the actual ability to do the job you can build that but the right attributes and they're referencing the book references when you're hiring talent but as a talented person you also have to look at the attributes of the company the inverse is true so if they're not doing the things that you just said joe if if they're sitting around and and they're in 1995 well if that's not what you want if you don't want to go the way of blockbuster instead of the way of the dodo then then you probably need to find a new company sooner rather than later um joe did you have any final thoughts before i hand it off to noah uh no i thought this was a great convo and uh it was it was an honor to sit here and yap with you and, and discuss this. I hope everybody got something out of it. All right, Noah. Pleasure, Lisa, Joe. Another wonderful session. Uh, very thankful to be here and, and to sit and listen. And it's uh, awesome to wrap it up. So, really, the first key takeaway that I took away is boundaries are crucial to efficiencies. Having those boundaries where employees can take a step away and disengage from their work life so when they need to step back onto their work life they're more engaged and have the energy this also combats burnouts a big point that joe uh, mentioned was being brave and giving people feedback and this goes both ways as a leader and also someone who's being led to be able to give feedback up the chain of command and down the chain of command it really fosters that environment of growth and learning and lets people know that hey i'm noticing you're not working per your usual uh, speed. How can I help? What, what's going on in your personal life? And, and definitely allows them to, you know, continue that relationship. And lastly, a comment from Jonathan in the uh, comment sections was really to combat uh, employee disengagement. Disengagement, pardon me, is to utilize survey monkeys and surveys. And Lisa brought up a really great point uh, of her prior experiences, but not creating a survey with typical questions: Are you engaged? One to ten, but more personal questions where the person taking the survey is more engaged and has to critically think and already feels that the person who asked the survey is really leaning in to, to their lives. So again, a wonderful session, Joe and Lisa. It was great to sit here and uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. Yes, thanks both of you. Um, I'm gonna go through a few, hey, if you're interested, um, Joe and I are part of the Talent War Group Leadership Collective. Um, you can get more information about us on the website. We are an executive search and talent advisory firm. Um, don't forget, you got to read the book. Uh, I, I had it here. I had to make sure I didn't put my coffee on it. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> um, but you can always uh, hire speakers, email info at talentwargroup.com. Um, the other thing is we've got the Judberg podcast that Fran Rachapi is um, spearheading. Absolutely fantastic story with regards to the background of what the title means. Just the title is interesting. And he's got everyone from small business owners to large business owners. Um, he's got future Olympians in there. He's got a lot of previous Olympians in future episodes. There's a lot of really neat stuff coming out in the Jed Bird podcast. Yeah, he's, episode, killing, it. he's killing it. He's absolutely yeah, killing it with that. Yeah, that's awesome. Definitely, definitely. He's got episode four is actually coming out tomorrow um, using, oh, I can't read those words. He uses really big words. So be an intellectual if you want to listen to it or bring your dictionary. Um, the title alone has multi-syllabic words in it. Not that I'm not capable of reading them, but I don't want to embarrass myself. Uh, next week, Wednesday, Rich Devinney is running our next LinkedIn Live. That'll be podcast number 31. He's got a guest coming on, Dan Coyle, um, who is actually a two-time published author. It's next week, Wednesday at 1 p.m. Uh, again, if you enjoyed this discussion, please share, like, and comment however you listen to your podcasts. And please check out our website. Uh, we are definitely interested in helping you make your business better. Thanks to everybody for all the comments you made. Keep them coming because that is exactly what we want to do. Talent War Group is all about making the business world more effective, more efficient, 
And based on this conversation, a little bit more fun. Thank you.